tease you, right? You, uh, it's it's it can cause serious injury or worse uh, if these autonomous systems don't behave the way we want them to behave. And, uh, if we look at this field of autonomy, I think broadly historically, what have been the technology drivers? What areas have really uh, been driving autonomy? And there's one kind of uh, silent area that's missing on this slide, which is control theory. Control theory is really the area that has been the driver for autonomy. But if you talk to anybody working in the autonomy industry today, there are two areas that seem to be uh, the most talked about, right? The one is roboticists and the other is AI or machine learning experts. Roboticists, of course, have very deep knowledge on building systems that work in well-structured and semi-structured environments. And roboticists uh, often address the very real challenges posed by hardware and software in the autonomy stack. And increasingly, roboticists have been looking at how do these systems work when uh, they have to work alongside humans, cooperating and collaborating with them. Whereas AI and machine learning experts uh, have been uh, continuously demonstrating preternatural abilities of modern neural systems to do more and more uh, fantastic sounding things, right? Uh, defeating human top human players at very complex games uh, or uh, even um, being able to drive cars in uh, with respect to cars like Tesla. Uh, they the, the the philosophy in AI machine learning is more on more about pushing boundaries on where autonomous agents can operate. So uh, while roboticists uh, uh, kind of flourish in well structured and semi structured environments, the AI machine learning crowd really wants us to take autonomy in uncertain and unstructured environments. And also the whole AI machine learning deep learning. Uh, revolution that has happened over the last few years has really shifted the paradigm from engineered code to having to reason about code that's continually evolving or learning, right? So these I think are two main technology drivers in addition to control theory, which has of course for several years provided the mathematical formalism on which to build several of the algorithms that enable systems to be autonomous. So then a question can be, what is the role of software engineering and formal methods people, right? I mean, there seems to be autonomy is already well represented. Well, I would argue one of the main roles of software engineering and formal methods people is to go up to the people who are designing these autonomous systems and tell them, I told you so, you should have proved your thing, you should have tested your thing, and you can see what happens when you don't test your uh, systems adequately or you don't have a rigorous way of developing the software for these autonomous systems, right? There have been several documented cases of uh, the crown jewels of autonomy uh, showing extremely bad behavior in public, right? I mean, they crash, uh, they don't anticipate things that have that don't exist in their training set, and in fact, there have been some very unfortunate cases that have led to fatalities, such as the a uh, very publicized accident by an Uber vehicle in Arizona that ended up killing a pedestrian. So, uh, but more seriously, what is the role of software engineering or formal methods people? So my, what I'm going to uh, hypothesize in this talk is what, what software engineering and formal methods people can really do is work on the design automation pipeline for autonomy. And while this is a vague and very broad idea, I think there are several aspects of it which are interesting for us, right? So if you look at the aspect of what are the software architectures or system architectures that autonomous systems should use, then that's an area where we can contribute. And there are several challenges. For example, you need to be able to articulate assumptions and guarantees by functional components. You need to be able to support runtime monitoring and mitigation, you need to be able to give platform level real time guarantees. If you look at verification or testing, the challenges are how can we come up with safety proofs when we know so little about the environment? How can we reason about robustness of ML or AI models? What about certification of these systems? How about uh, creating assurance cases when you have these learning enabled components in your systems? How can we quantify uncertainty? And here it's interesting that 
not only are we dealing with systems that are inherently stochastic, we also, so there is aleatoric uncertainty, but there's also epistemic uncertainty because we don't just know enough about the environment in which these systems operate, right? If I design a self-driving car for a sunny Southern California uh, roads or even Northern California roads, having that vehicle drive in uh, a place like the country I come from in India is completely different thing, right? Or in UK where uh, the amount of rain or the kind of weather that you get is completely different than uh, what we have in California. So how do we anticipate the different environments in which these uh, systems can operate it has to be looked at through the lens of epistemic uncertainty. There's just lots of uh, uncertainty there. Uh, furthermore, how do we do compositional reasoning of the autonomy stack? There are all these different moving parts in the software stack of an autonomous uh, car. Already cars were well known as uh, the most software intensive device that we see in our daily lives. Uh, it, it, it always surprised me when I used to work at Toyota that a modern Lexus has about 10 times the amount of lines of code as a fighter jet or as Windows Vista. Uh, I, I bet even Windows 11, if you just um, measure the software lines of code, it's likely that the amount, the number of lines of code in a modern car exceeds that by a large amount. So we, uh, on top of this, now we are adding this whole autonomy stack, right? Where we not, don't even have code. We just have a bunch of numbers sitting around calling themselves a neural network, right? So how do we reason about these kind of things is uh, going to be important. When it comes to the design and synthesis aspect, how do we do correct by construction design of learning enabled components? Uh, learning enabled components, the objective has never been kind of correct by construction. It has always been improved accuracy, right? So how do we kind of fit them within this rubric of formal reasoning? Uh, what kind of guarantees can we give for existing learning algorithms? How can we model uncertainty for these uh, algorithms and make them uncertainty aware? And I think one of the most important aspect of any formal method is what are the specifications that you are trying to verify against? And that's again a very important topic, right? When we have these complex systems operating in uncertain environments with these machine learning AI based components, we we can't be, stay in our comfort zone, right? We can't just say, oh, you know what, whole logic is going to solve everything. That's not going to work. We have to be able to express probabilistic and deterministic properties of models we need to be able to reason about individual system behaviors, but we also need to think about hyper properties, right? About sets of system behaviors. We need to be able to think about properties of ML AI components, which might be quite uh, non-traditional when compared to traditional software specifications. And I think what's very interesting is we also need to think about specifications for data. And that's not something that we have traditionally as a community looked at, right? Now we are, we are not only reasoning about the software artifacts, but actually the data that was used to train this software. And uh, there is the issue of conformance. Do your high level uh, expectations match your low level deployment? There's also the reasoning that needs to be done there. So I think there are, and of course, this is a far from complete list of challenge problems. I just highlighted some of them that I felt were interesting uh, to this audience. And there are several other challenges. So there is a very uh, important role that I think software engineering uh, formal methods people have to play to make sure that autonomous systems that we are going to deploy in the future are going to be safe and reliable, and they are going to be engineered products and not just some experiment in somebody's lab. Uh, here's one one proposal for design automation for autonomy that essentially the red uh, kind of uh, part of this diagram is the traditional design process where you essentially uh, follow these downward gray arrows, right? You start with wanting to uh, have safety assurance. Uh, excuse me, it looks like there's somebody waiting in the lobby. I'm, I'm admitting them, so please. Okay, okay great. So, um, 
you want to start with safety assurance and you you kind of have this waterfall model where you start with a very high level top level idea of you want safety that dictates how you design your system that dictates how you design your architecture that dictates how you do testing and verification and runtime assurance often comes as towards the end of the design process but i think when we design for autonomy we have to kind of start thinking bottom up so we have to think we are going to need runtime assurance for that what kind of constraints are we going to need on the software that we write to make sure that whatever assumptions that our testing and verification tools are going to make are going to translate into monitors that we need to deploy at runtime. If based on what kinds of testing and verification tools we want to succeed, we have to think about what kinds of system architecture do we need to design that will guarantee that we can actually test and verify uh, the assumptions or the uh, properties that we are interested in. Our architecture is going to dictate what kinds of design exploration techniques are we going to need. Our system design is going to uh, basically dictate what kinds of safety assurance can we give and what kinds of languages are we going to need for verification, uh, analysis and control? What kind of guarantees do we want our downstream monitors and design uh, to uh, provide? So in some sense, designing for autonomy is the design process kind of turned on its head, right? We have to start thinking from what can we verify and based on that go backward and think about what are the assumptions that are required so that eventually I'll be able to verify this. So I think this is an interesting take on how we need to enhance the design process. So they, we are going to, of course, retain many elements of the traditional design processes, but we also need to enhance our thinking that how can we kind of think forward on what are the things we are going to need downstream and based on that start making adjustments to the things that uh, we do typically in a downward fashion in the waterfall process. All right, so so far I have been talking about very high level abstract things. So let me now talk about very specific things uh, and I'm going to talk about where the pro work that is being done in uh, our lab here at USC fits in. So we are basically focusing on languages for analysis, uh, languages for verification, and the types of guarantees that we can provide using monitors and design. Okay. So uh, th this is again just a very high level overview of the kind of problems that we are interested in looking at in my lab. And uh, broadly, if you look at the software stack for autonomy, at one end of the stack is uh, the modules that do sensing, uh, that make a sense of the environment the autonomous system is operating in. Then you use a perception module to convert your sensor data into something that your downstream models can use. Then you have your planning, decision-making control modules, which then uh, go to some kind of a low-level controller which go to your actuators, right? So there are these different pipe stages in the pipeline of an autonomous software stack. The ones that we are interested in the most are perception, planning and control, and decision making. So just uh, sampling some problems uh, from this slide here, uh, if when we come to perception systems, we want to check if the perception makes reasonable judgments. Uh, when we talk about planning and control, we want to be able to monitor safety in real time and perhaps give some probabilistic guarantees. When it comes to decision making, we want to uh, prove safety of systems using control theoretic or statistical methods. So there are there is a large number of problems that exist in the space of autonomous systems, and these are some specific example problems that are being worked on in uh, in our lab here. So I want to drill down uh, into this uh, gamut of research problems and the ones in red are the ones that I uh, want to talk about. I don't think I'll get time to talk about predictive and clairvoyant monitoring, but I would like to tell you or, or the work on trust quantification, but I would like to tell you a little bit about work we are doing on learning safe controllers or control policies in uncertain environments. So there we are focusing on uh, this idea of how can we do reinforcement learning when we are given high level formal specifications. I want to share a little bit about wor work we are doing on learning from demonstrations and task objectives. 
I'll talk a little bit about adversarial testing for decision making systems. And finally, I want to talk about uh, testing perception modules. Uh, the, I, I'm going to send uh, you the slides, Mohammed. So uh, if you are interested in any other topics, I'll be happy to talk offline. Although things in gray are also things that are happening in my lab, I, I, I won't uh, be talking about those today. OK, uh, so before we go into the specific research directions, I want to kind of give uh, the philosophy of what I mean by lightweight formal methods, right? So the talk title has lightweight formal methods. So let me uh, drill down a little bit on what I mean by that. So the observation is that in many uh, design and verification challenges for autonomous systems, often system specifications or task objectives or user commands or interfaces or design contracts are often vague and ambiguous because they are given in natural language. Right. Uh, for example, you might have your if you are uh, an engineer in a, a company that's designing the new greatest and best uh, autonomous car, then your manager might tell you that, oh, make sure that uh, when it's uh, an, a traffic intersection uh, with a right of way, you are able to make sure that your autonomous car can see pedestrians and vehicles that may cross your path and accordingly make adjustments to your algorithm. I mean, this sounds like a very specific technical engineering task, but it's also incredibly vague, right? So what the philosophy that I'm going to argue will make these imprecisions and vaguenesses go away is the use of mathematically precise and machine checkable formalisms to express various artifacts in the engineering process. So uh, one of the tools that we use a lot in my lab is the tool of signal temporal logic, and I'm going to talk, give you a very brief overview of that in the next couple of slides. But the second part of this philosophy is to also develop an ecosystem of tools around these formalisms that allow us to engineer safe autonomous systems both at design time and at deployment time. And finally, uh, we should leverage the advances in AI, deep learning, and robotics and combine them with the rigor provided by logic based formal methods. So here's the lightweight formal methods tool that I want to talk about signal temporal logic, which was invented by Oded Mahler and Dea Nitschkovic, uh, and, and then later uh, also extended by Alexandre Donze, uh, and with seminal contributions from Georgios Fenikos and others. Okay, so here's a very basic signal temporal logic formula. This basically says that always between time 0 and 100, the value of the signal X should remain between 1 and 3. Okay, so this might seem like a simple bounds check, but you can also do something a little bit more fancy by nesting temporal operators. So this formula says eventually between time 20 and 60, there is some time T such that from that time onwards, always the value, absolute value of the signal X remains less than 0.1. So now if you are a control uh, theory minded person, you immediately see that what this is, this particular specification is expressing is that the settling time of my system is between 20 and 60 seconds. And uh, uh, I can give you more, I have more examples of STL specifications in the context of autonomy on later slides, but one thing, I think is unique and very powerful about STL is that in addition to the typical Boolean semantics that we have, do I satisfy the property or do I not satisfy the property? STL also has quantitative semantics, which means that you can come up with a degree of satisfaction uh, that allows you to say how bad is the violation or how far am I from the bad set? So here's an example of how you compute this robustness uh, or robust satisfaction value. Basically, here is the formula that says always between time 50 and 100, the value of the signal X should be less than 3. Now, clearly, the first signal on the left does not satisfy this formula, right? Because between time 50 and 100, actually, there's no time point where the value of X is less than 3. Whereas, if you look, to the, look at the signal to the right, for all time points, the value of X is less than 3 between time 50 and 100. For the left-hand signal, you can kind of uh, quantify how bad the violation is by looking at how much inside the bad set does my signal go, right? And 
for the right hand side signal, you can quantify how far you are from bad by looking at how close to bad do I get. So in STL, basically you come up with this sign distance that allows you to assign some kind of a degree of satisfaction to your STL formula. Right. So here are some examples of specifying robot tasks or objectives in STL. So the first line uh, in natural language says if the robot can turn on the light in a reasonable amount of time, then retrieve the fuel within some uh, tau two seconds. OK, so we can now formalize this in STL by saying something like always whenever, whenever within tau one seconds the light turns on, it implies that within tau two seconds after that, the uh, position of the robot from the location that contains the fuel is zero and the hold fuel predicate, which indicates that the robot is holding the fuel, is equal to one. Okay. Another specification that says that the robot should be within one cell of the fuel every 10 minutes and one cell of the secret every 10 minutes. Okay. So this is basically expressed by the STL formula. Always whenever uh, the within 10 seconds, the distance between the robot and the fuel is uh, less than one. And within 10 seconds, uh, the distance between the robot and the secret location is less than or equal to one. OK, so uh, remember the things that are inside have to happen at every single time point. So no matter where you are on the map, within 10 seconds, you have to uh, satisfy uh, that you are within one location of fuel and within 10 seconds, you're within one uh, cell of the secret location. OK, or you can also think about the robot must have the key to unlock the room with the secret and must not walk through any cell with the fire. Similarly, you could think about how you could formalize this in STL. Here are some uh, specifying how you can. Uh, here's an example of how you can specify autonomous driving constraints and specifications. So here this is uh, an autonomous vehicle. So in this scenario, what's happening is the blue car is trying to merge in front of the red car and the red car is the car that we are kind of controlling or designing. And what we want to make sure is no matter how crazy the blue car driver is, we want to make sure that the red car never collides with the blue car. Now, of course, the blue car's driver could be having a really rough day or they could just be distracted and they could slam into you uh, with a side on collision, right? And in that case, there's very little you can do. There's no way you can avoid an accident if somebody is maliciously trying to slam into you. So what makes this whole scenario reasonable is to say that, well, let me understand what are reasonable scenarios under which my red car can respond and should respond. So the first specification says that the blue car should initiate the merge maneuver to the right lane only when the red car is at least D safe, which is longitudinal distance behind the point immediately to the right of the blue car. OK, and that can be expressed with the STL specification here that uses this until operator. Uh, the second specification says that the red car should remain some D safe distance behind the blue car. OK, so that basically says always distance between me and the blue car is greater than some D safe. And then you want to really have the system level guarantee say, that says that as long as the blue car satisfies its constraint, it's not a crazy person, then the red car should satisfy its specification okay, that I don't basically collide. So uh, I, what I want to give through these examples is just a flavor of the different kinds of things you can do with STL uh, in the context of autonomous systems. All right, so now I really want to start talking about the specific techniques, and this is going to be the most technical part of the talk. Uh, and if you want to, I, I've tried to keep the discussions at a very high level. So if you want to have more detailed discussions about how these techniques work, the stock is not the right place. I would be happy to point you to the papers or have an online discussion on this. OK, so I'm going to talk about four different things. Reinforcement learning from STL specifications, learning from demonstrations and task objectives, adversarial training and perception monitoring. All right, so um, I'm sure that most people in computer science today, when before graduating, have to 
have heard of reinforcement learning or have taken a course that talks about reinforcement learning. It's becoming, uh, when, when I was a graduate student, that buzzword was distributed systems or concurrent programming. Now it's re reinforcement learning or deep learning, right? You cannot escape it. But for in case you have managed to insulate yourself from RL, here's a very quick and brief introduction to RL. So the way RL operates is you assume that you have an you are an autonomous agent operating in an uncertain environment, and the agent's configuration, the values of all possible state variables, everything that characterizes that agent in the world is captured in its state. And the agent is in some state S. In the state S, it takes some action A. Once it takes this action A, the environment tells the agent, OK, from this state, if you took this action, with some probability, I'm going to move you to this new state, S prime. And I'm going to give you some reward for taking this action. Now, this reward could be something that indicates that you did a good job. This was an action that I liked, or it could indicate, no, this was really bad and I need to punish you. So I'm going to give you a negative reward. OK, and the way reinforcement learning works is this agent continuously interacts with the environment, getting uh, rewards or punishments. And hopefully that allows it to learn what actions are the good actions to take and what actions should I avoid. And what's important to recognize here is that this is not a deterministic system, right? So it's a stochastic system. So, so there, there are going to be some actions that are good with which with some probability are going to take you to states that are bad and going to give you punishment. But that should not make those actions uh, basically bad, right? You should try this experiment several times to understand that, you know, actually on an average, this action leads to good. So perhaps this is a good action and I should not pay a lot of uh, credence into this one occasion where I got a bad reward. So that's really the setting. You have a stochastic environment. You keep taking actions in states. You keep getting rewards and the training process or the learning process is figuring out what is the policy that I should use that maximizes the expected long term reward that I get? OK, so if you take the sum of the rewards that you get along a behavior, uh, maybe you discount them if you want to consider an infinite behavior to make the infinite sum well defined. And then uh, you take the expectation over all possible stochastic things that may happen. And the you want to choose a policy that's going to give you the best expected reward. That's the purpose of reinforcement learning. And uh, unfortunately, reinforcement learning, as I just described, is highly dependent on how you define the rewards. So here's an example from uh, one of the early uh, RL papers uh, that shows that poorly designed reward functions can lead to bad agents. So this was um, the application of an RL algorithm to try and make this little white boat uh, essentially race through this track. You can barely see the track in this video. It's basically uh, the region between these two sets of dotted lines uh, to the bottom of the video. And the point was the white boat should remain within these two dotted lines and uh, it can occasionally go out of the track if it sees these kind of yellow uh, nuggets pop up. These are kind of indicating some gold coins or something, right? And the purpose of this video game was how quickly can you finish this course while making sure that you earn lots of rewards? Okay, the way this reward function was designed was the people who designed the first RL algorithm for this thought, oh, let's reward the boat whenever it collects these gold coins so that we become rich and we uh, get a high score. What was ignored in this reward that, well, the boat has to finish the course, right? You have to actually go from a start location to an end location and finish it. The agent very quickly learned that, you know what? If I just stay hovering around the reward, I don't really care if I collide into things, if I crash into boats, as long as I keep collecting these gold coins, my policy that just keeps circling in one place ignoring the race, ignoring my task objectives and just collecting these rewards is the best policy. 
right? So basically, this is an example of a policy that's unsafe because it's crashing into things. It does not satisfy the task objective of finishing the race, but it does maximize the rewards, right? So clearly, there was something wrong in the way these reward functions were designed. So now this has kind of spawned an entire sub area of how should we shape the rewards? How should we design the rewards in a way that the behaviors that maximize the rewards actually are desirable behaviors? So having worked in the world of specifications for a long time, uh, we thought that, wait a minute, when we are training these agents to do something, don't you know what the agent should do? Can't you express the high level specifications, high level task objectives as specifications and then train the RL algorithm to satisfying those specifications? Isn't that what responsible software engineering people do? And uh, it turns out that this is not actually an easy problem to solve. So before I go into the details, I just want to give you some uh, taxonomy of RL methods uh, that exist out there, because I will be using some of these words uh, while describing the techniques that we are looking at. So if you look at classical model-based RL, there you are basically given a Markov decision process, which is states, actions, transition probabilities, state-based rewards. And the goal is to compute a stochastic policy that maximizes the expected return. And solutions are based on classic algorithms such as value iteration, policy iteration, or linear programming. Basically, dynamic programming uh, became famous through its use in solving reinforcement learning problems. And uh, there's a famous Bellman optimality condition that is utilized in Try in, in many of these dynamic programming based algorithms. And classical model based RL assumes that you have finite discrete set of states and actions uh, and um, that somebody gives you the MDP on which you want to design the stochastic policy. So classical model free RL, uh, you're given a simulator. You're not given the world. You're not given the MDP description. And you want to learn a policy that is as close as possible to the optimal policy learned using classical methods. Okay, so you kind of have to learn the model uh, that you are operating in as well as learn the policy. And there are several uh, ways to solve this. So if you look at the classical methods, there's Q learning, where again you assume that you have discrete states and actions. And then uh, what started in about 2014, 2015 is this whole area of deep RL where uh, you have very few assumptions about the environment. So you could have continuous sets of states, you could have continuous space of actions, and there are several uh, methods that have become quite popular. So policy gradient methods uh, like PPO, TRPO, there are many of these acronym methods here. There are deep Q learning based methods, actor critic methods, and so on. But the main kind of driver in deep RL technology is coming up with neural networks to express the what's known as the value function in RL and uh, also neural network to represent the policy. And that kind of accelerates uh, the whole learning process with the use of neural networks. Okay, and if you look at the world of RL from logical specifications, this has become a hot top topic in the formal methods community. There are several recent papers, some of the early ones from 2014, to uh, papers that are uh, appearing uh, pretty much in every top ML and uh, formal methods conference. And this is a very crude uh, summary of all the work that's been done so far. Uh, one of the directions in these papers tries to convert the satisfaction of a temporal logic property into a zero one reward with some special handling because you are really trying to um, satisfy an omega regular property, right? So you can't at any given point of time saying, oh, now I have satisfied the property by just looking at a finite behavior because behaviors are meant to be infinite because the properties uh, over infinite sequences of, of states. So uh, basic idea is you give a reward of zero. If you don't satisfy the property, you give a reward of one if you do satisfy the property. The other uh, sort of direction people have looked at is converting temporal specifications into some kind of mixed integer linear programs and solving the training problem using optimization methods. 
And then more recently, people have started looking into breaking up specifications into sub goals and then training each sub goal sequentially using um, again uh, traditional RL based methods. So uh, we found some issues in the current methods, which is why we have uh, been basically we have proposed uh, three different ideas and I'm going to talk about two of them. So in idea zero, we basically try to use these quantitative semantics of STL instead of cumulative rewards to decide which policies look like they have a higher chance of satisfying a given STL specification. It's a heuristic approach. It converges quite fast compared to deep RL methods due to better local rewards, but our training variance could be high and plus we don't really give any guarantees. We also uh, had a, another piece of work where we are using STL as a reward function in a receding horizon control uh, style uh, algorithm where <clears throat> we are trying to learn the model on the fly uh, using model based deep RL methods uh, and then trying to use kind of an MPC formulation there. Uh, this uh, one of the disadvantages it requires uh, learning high fidelity models and there are no again we don't give any guarantees and the third idea which is what I'm most excited about is uh, a paper we have under submission where we want to use symbolic automata derived from STL to shape rewards so this shows faster conversions than all state-of-the-art RL from temporal logic algorithms it gives you guarantees of satisfaction uh, so it is a correct by construction algorithm and uh, one of the disadvantage is that we currently are restricted to discrete states and uh, state spaces and action spaces, but we have an extension to continuous state spaces that's uh, ongoing work. OK, so uh, ideas, let's drill into the idea zero a little bit. So the main idea is that uh, we want to uh, have these robust satisfaction semantics, but we want to interpret them only over a bounded horizon. So during the RL procedure, what we are going to do is we are going to try and take a few actions over this bounded horizon, which in the RL literature is called a case step rollout. And we are going to compute the robustness over just this trajectory fragment. And we are going to use that as a reward. And the intuition is we want the reward satisfying the STL formula over the rollout horizon. Uh, we want to reward uh, whenever you satisfy the STL formula and you want to penalize not satisfying it. So for example, uh, I have these behaviors here where the yellow trajectories indicate uh, not good performance, uh, but not bad performance either over the temporal logic formula. The green behavior somehow uh, indicates very good performance and the red behavior is terrible performance. Uh, I, I don't know what temporal logic property I had in mind when I designed these, but just imagine that the colors indicate how close you are to satisfying the property. OK, so what you go do is for each of these states, you uh, roll out the uh, behavior over some horizon, compute the robustness and basically use that as a reward. So you are going to prefer choosing actions that kind of keep you closer to satisfying the STL formula as much as possible. Okay. So here is uh, an example of how that works. So uh, this is uh, the famous cart pole example that was a motivating motivating example in the first deep RL paper, and this is the vanilla RL agent in its 730th iteration. This is exactly the reward that the first cart pole paper used, and uh, my student described something um, interesting. The agent using the vanilla RL reward has a tendency to do self harm. Uh, sorry for my use of the word, but my students. Uh, description was my agents become suicidal. So I told him, what do you mean by that? So he said that basically this reward function gives a reward of one to stay within uh, some degrees of upright and it gives a reward of minus 10 otherwise. So initially my deep RL algorithm, the neural network has some random weight. So the policies that are initially being explored are all kind of crappy policies and the agent, the poor agent basically keeps falling over and all it learns is this world is a cruel place where all I get is criticism, right? And the way this experiment is set up, you stop getting these penalties once the episode ends. So very quickly the agent learns that, you know what, it's better to end this episode than stay alive in this world and receive this constant criticism, right? 
So uh, it takes a while for these Z parallel algorithms to discover that actually there is good in this world and I should stay upright and I will keep getting praises. And that's when uh, after a few thousand iterations, it will learn the optimal policy that keeps it upright. But instead, if we use STL based rewards, which tell it, you know what, the world is not a random place. If you do this, this, this and this, you will get good rewards and that's what should motivate you to you know stay alive and not end the episode right so if we use this stl reward in just the 340th iteration we have an agent that looks like it's able to keep this card pool uh, alive for a long time all right so uh, the second yes if you don't mind a couple of things once i'm a bit conscious about time we have about 11, 12 minutes left, and you have a lot of ideas that you want to present. I don't know how you want to um, organize this. It's up to you. Uh, yeah. The second thing, uh, so so about that uh, reward and and uh, the degree of robustness that is being used, I guess as as the um, as the uh, reward function. Uh, couldn't you? Uh, I, I guess you mentioned at some point you could decompose the formula and and then maybe uh, give a hint about the satisfaction of each of those sub formulae. Is is that an idea you are going to explore or? Uh, so that's not an idea we have explored. That's an idea other people have explored. I would uh, suggest papers by Rajiv Alur's group, uh, Kishore Jyoti Murugan and Suguman Bansal. They have work on this topic. So in yeah. this context, couldn't you uh, decompose uh, the formula and then use the rewards, the, the robustness of these sub formula and then feed them into your... your... Uh, absolutely. That's something we have not explored, but that's definitely something we could do. Yeah. yeah. So I, also a good point. Thanks for the reminder about time. So I'm going to try and... Uh, focus on the high level bits in the rest of this uh, thing. Uh, main thing I want to tell you about idea two is what we found is in RL, sparse rewards are not good, right? I mean, here was again an example of a sparse reward. It, what, what I mean by a sparse reward is very rarely do you get a reward. Most of the time you get criticisms. And when you have a sparse reward, it takes a while for the algorithm to converge to an optimal policy. And most RL from temporal logic papers basically end up in having sparse rewards. So our idea, kind of math-free explanation of idea two is we look at the symbolic specification automaton for the given formula and associate states that are closer to the goal with lower values of potential and states that are further away from the goal with higher value of potential. And you want to shape rewards for each state action pair with the potential difference between the states. Roughly, higher the potential difference, more sense does it make to go from a state with higher potential to a lower potential. And among the various lower potential states that you have, you want to go to the one with the lowest potential. So uh, the theorem that we have in this paper is that if you augment a um, sparse rewarding algorithm like the one used in the RL from temporal logic work with this potential based rewarding, then it guarantees that you can still find a policy that maximizes the probability of satisfaction with respect to the automaton, automaton objective, but our experiments show that we can actually converge much faster. So I don't want to go into the details of this experiment here, but basically what we want the agent to do here is we want in the first um, uh, example, we want it to go from a to B to C, and this is, by the way, sequential tasks are uh, some of the most challenging things to do for RL algorithms, uh, but for us it's easy because you can just express a sequential task in an automaton. And if you look at uh, the results here, uh, the red curve is the results of our uh, algorithm, the blue curve is the results of several other methods that are kind of all have zero probability of satisfaction of the learned policy, whereas we actually learn a policy that will maximize probability of satisfaction. Uh, the second example is this patrolling task where we have to keep visiting A and B uh, one after the other in some order. And again, the red curve is our uh, curve where, which shows that we are the fastest to converge to the uh, probability to a high probability of satisfaction uh, compared to all other methods. All right. Uh, I want to talk very quickly about learning from demonstrations. Uh, it's a popular paradigm for learning based controller synthesis in robotics and has many different flavors. I'm not going to go into the details of those. What I want to talk about is even in the space of learning from demonstrations, if we have high level temporal objectives, maybe in your favorite temporal logic, uh, you can do better. 
And the first question we often get is, if you have demonstrations, why, why do you need temporal logic? So the problem is that when you give demonstrations, many of these learning from demonstrations methods assume that the demonstrator is perfect. It's a human expert who knows exactly how to achieve the task objective. But the reality is most demonstrators are grad students uh, who are not perfect, right? Um, and I mean, it's not just about the imperfectness of the grad students. It could be just that the robot that you're trying to control the actual path planning problem or the control problem might be really hard. So for example, if you have a robot with several different joints and you are trying to make it move in its configuration space and pick up something and put it something somewhere else, you would need a computer in your head to figure out what is all the configurations of the joint angles that you should have to make it move in a certain path in the space. It's not an easy problem. So it, giving demonstrations itself might be hard. So many of the demonstrations you end up giving may be suboptimal. Um, the second thing is when you're giving demonstrations, you're again handicapping your autonomous agent by saying that, oh, you can only infer my desired intent from the demonstrations. I'm not going to tell you anything about what I want to achieve, which is again silly because we know what we want to achieve. So why don't we tell the autonomous agent what we want to achieve and give it demonstrations? So the main idea what we want to uh, focus on in this work is we want to use temporal logic specifications to tell the autonomous agent what to accomplish. And then we want to give it demos that kind of give partial glimpses into how to accomplish it. OK, so again, we have a number of ideas in this uh, topic. Our uh, first idea is we use STL specifications to rank the demonstrations. So demonstrations that seem to satisfy the task objectives are going to have higher weight than the ones that don't. And then we can reward the states in a demonstration with higher robust satis that, that are in a demonstration with higher robust satisfaction value. And we are going to punish the states that are in a demonstration with lower robustness value. With the intuition that these state action sequences led to a good behavior, so these should be rewarded these state actions did not lead to a good behavior, so these should be punished, okay? And uh, in the second idea, we kind of explore that we may not have one specification. In fact, we might have competing or complementary specifications. So there the idea was, uh, if you have several STL objectives, have the user specify their relative priorities using some kind of a structure like a directed acyclic graph, and then use a weighted average of the robustness values of these different specifications where the weights are computed from the priorities. And then we have some follow up work where we have extended this to continuous spaces with function approximations. And we have also extended this to stochastic environments by basically not only looking at demonstrations, but things around demonstrations. OK, so here are some uh, ex example, uh, just some experimental results. So. Uh, on the left hand side is the ground truth uh, reward map. So the way to look at this reward map is the darker the shade of blue, the higher reward you get in that state. And the white cells are cells where you get no reward. So in this particular map, it represents an obstacle. OK, so uh, the ground truth is that uh, you get these light blue rewards in all these different cells. And if you reach the corner cell, you get this big dark blue reward, right? And uh, what is perceived as state of the art in learning from demonstrations in the ML literature is this max causal entropy inverse reinforcement learning method, where after 50 demonstrations, it kind of learns that uh, surely the corner cell is important and maybe things around it, but uh, it doesn't really understand that there are obstacles uh, and it doesn't really understand uh, that I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but uh, some somewhere in the center of the uh, world is not such a great state to be in. OK, and this is after 50 optimal demonstrations, whereas we learn the reward surface that's shown in the rightmost figure after three demonstrations, where two of them are optimal and one of them is a bad demonstration that shows the agent colliding with an obstacle. OK, so additional information from specifications kind of dramatically improves how many demonstrations you need to give. It's two orders of magnitude better than state of the art with the additional high level task objective. Uh, we can also uh, have incomplete 
or bad demonstrations. So we have some optimal and good demonstrations. We have bad demonstrations and we can combine these to learn good reward uh, functions. We can have continuous and uh, stochastic spaces. So this is a little driving setup that my student has where uh, he gives demonstrations uh, using this game environment that he's built using the steering wheel and accelerator setup and he's able to learn how to he's able to teach an agent how to autonomously drive using a bunch of demonstrations using this setup all right i want to now breeze through a couple of other ideas one idea is uh, on adversarial testing so here the problem is that autonomous systems operate in highly uncertain environments and we want to uh, make the system under design satisfy its specification the presence of an adversarial environment and the challenge is uh, uh, one of my colleagues has this nice sentence that i have repeated on this slide that if you assume that your environment is completely lawless finding bugs in autonomous systems is like finding hay in a haystack right it's far too easy to find bugs so just imagine that you are developing an adaptive cruise controller and a car in front of you on a freeway or a highway starts driving backwards. There's nothing you can do, right? Uh, you, you cannot drive backwards because you will collide in a car that's behind you. And you may be in a single lane, so you cannot drive forward. You cannot even stay where you are. So there's nothing you can do. So there has to be some set of restrictions that we can impose on the environment, which then allows us to make sense of the testing problem. So our approach is we want to identify rules that the adversarial environment must be required to obey and, ex and we must uh, be able to express safety specifications of the ecosystem. And then under these conditions, we want to find environment behaviors that cause the ego to fade its back. As you may have guessed by now, uh, to express these rules and specifications, you use we use STL and we are exploring a machine learning method again deep reinforcement learning to make to find behaviors where the environment satisfies some rules but the ego vehicle does not so we are using this adversarial testing idea using deep rl where we are able to find violations so for example uh, on the leftmost uh, picture is an example of a safe merge the middle picture is a case where the blue car breaks its rules. So that's that's a collision, but that's not a good collision to find because the red car couldn't have done anything. But the rightmost picture is a picture where the blue car actually does satisfy all its rules, but the red car is unable to stop in time. So that indicates a bug of your uh, safe distance following algorithm. It's not able to react in time to the blue car merging in front of it suddenly. OK. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide and then finally I want to just uh, talk about this one picture. So um, we want to reason about perception systems, right? I mean, here I have a picture of a neural network that's used for perception. It's called YOLO, a little bit of an unfortunate name for a neural network that's going to be used in a safety critical system. It's not you only live once, it's you only look once. So it, as you can imagine, there are several layers of neurons uh, in this neural network, right? And you have these convolutional layers which can have thousands of neurons and there are many, many stages. So this neural network is impossible for any kind of symbolic analysis, right? It has millions, uh, several hundred millions of neurons and it's not going to be something that you can, you, you can analyze formally. But what you can do is you can reason about the outputs of the neural network. OK, so in this work, what we have done is we want to kind of look at the laws of physics to impose sanity conditions on perceived object behavior. So we want to reason about things like permanence. If you see a car now, it should remain a car in the next frame and in the next frame, perhaps for a few frames. If you see a pedestrian walking, then the pedestrian is not suddenly going to turn into Superman and start zooming around, right? The pedestrian is going to have some sensible path that they are going to follow. If you uh, approach an object, then the bounding box of that object is going to increase in size. So these are kind of sanity conditions that we have been able to express in this logic uh, that reasons over post perception data streams. And this logic is called TQTL. Uh, it's a logic 
on these streams, timed quality temporal logic. And we have an efficient monitoring algorithm for this, which can compute a quality score that measures how well your property's sanity condition is satisfied. So the logic looks terrible. Um, as one of the co-inventors of this logic, I can say with absolute certainty that the syntax is nightmarish. So we are working on better ways to express properties in this logic. But just to give you a flavor, on the top is an example of a specification we would want that at every time step for all objects in the frame, if the object class is cyclist with probability greater than 0.7, then in the next five frames, the object uh, should still be classified as a cyclist with probability greater than 0.6. And here's how you would express that in TQTL. So we ran these kind of sanity conditions on state of the art neural networks, and we found some very interesting things, right? So for example, uh, if it is a cyclist should remain a cyclist was a property that was violated by this one frame, where for some reason the neural network thought there's a cyclist here. So if you zoom in, there's some box of newspapers that was classified as a cyclist. Now what's interesting is we don't have really access to the ground truth data, right? We don't have any ground truth labels. So we are able to predict that there is something awry in this frame without ha having any access to ground truth, just based on the fact that in the sequence of labels that the neural network should have produced, there was something anomalous. Similarly, YOLO uh, uh, completely misses the cyclist in the middle frame here. And you could conjecture that maybe there's this cycle in the background that you can barely see that confuses YOLO. We don't know, but uh, there's some reason it somehow misses the cyclist. And uh, hopefully that was not the frame where your vehicle was deciding, should I stop or should I go, right? Uh, so these are important kind of corner cases that neural networks for perception occasionally do have, and it's important to be able to detect them. What's interesting is we can do this without having any ground truth, just by looking at the se sequences of labels that these objects should produce. All right. So that kind of brings me to the end. Sorry, I had to breeze through uh, some of the later part, but I hope you still got a flavor of the kind of things that we are doing. So the key takeaways today are that lightweight formal methods can help make autonomous systems safer and re more reliable. And lightweight methods need work to integrate with existing AI ML algorithms, but once integrated, they can provide a lot of benefit. And there are many exciting challenge problems to work on in this particular area. And reasoning about safety is key. So I think uh, sometimes in, formal, in the formal methods community, we tend to be very elitist about how we view our formal methods. So proofs, tests, invariants, specifications, monitoring, everything helps, right? Anything is better than the state of the art, which is test to death and hope that it works. So I think that lightweight formal methods can change this philosophy and we can bring in very interesting tools that can actually improve how autonomous systems are built in today's world. With that, I would like to thank uh, you, Muhammad, again uh, for this invitation. Thank you, Preksha, for uh, organizing everything and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, the visit from folks in uh, your uh, hub as well. Uh, so hi again, Yasmin and Thomas, and uh, uh, hope to hear some interesting thoughts from you guys about what you think. Thank you very much. Very uh, much. Thank you. Lots of, uh, Lots of uh, very interesting uh, ideas. Let's take a couple of questions before we um, close this talk. Any questions from the audience? Uh, maybe I could start with one. So I, I have two questions here. One is related to the talk, one is completely unrelated. Uh, regarding that TQTL logic, um, so you, you, you said, you, you implied kind of that, that many of these systems are extremely brittle, right? So you, you, it's reasonably easy to find counterexamples. Typically you want counterexamples that really matter for, for the higher level decision making, right? Like if there is one frame that you miss, perhaps that's not the most uh, disastrous situation. Do you have any ideas how to find those counterexamples that are consequential for, for the higher level de decision making? That's a great question and that's actually something we are quite interested to uh, explore. So I think, I mean, what you rightly point out is 
hopefully somebody has done some kind of a temporal integration reasoning or there is some kind of a kalman filter that's taking in information from different sensors and uh, integrating it so that one frame doesn't radically impact but what was interesting in this uber example that i kind of breeze through but let me go back to that yeah this one here it just took three frames of bad decisions for a person to be killed right what happened is in one frame the uh, self driving software thought that it's um, it's an object uh, it's an unknown object so it could not predict the unknown object's trajectory in the next frame it thought it's a bicycle uh, no in the next frame it thought it's a vehicle uh, with and assuming it's a vehicle it's going to predict a very different trajectory and in the third frame it realized it's a bicycle and again it predicted uh, given that it's a bicycle it predicted a different trajectory about 1.3 seconds before impact it decided that whatever it is i need to stop and that was too late for the car to actually stop and uh, save this person right so it just took three frames of bad decisions so now the interesting question would be what this indicates is there was there is something broken in the higher level decision making system also right it, because of the way it was relying on the perception system so there is definitely work to be done at the intersection of how do the perception systems impact the decision making systems and that is something we are interested in working on we don't have uh, anything concrete in that area yet but it's a it's a really good question thank you are there any questions from the audience before I ask my second question? Anyone wants to chime in? Okay, I, I could ask uh, the second. Qu the second question is unrelated to what you presented. You you had some very nice work on on this score code distance and and measuring uh, the, the the conformance um, using a score code distance. Have you done any follow up work on that? Uh, that's a general question, and in, in, in more specifically. Have you at all looked at uh, how sampling uh, is, you said, I mean, in general, working with continuous systems is, is sometimes very difficult, so you want to look at the sample behavior. How sampling can influence the accuracy of your score code distance measurements? Yeah, so actually we did have a follow-up journal paper where we uh, extensively uh, evaluate this. So essentially two things, right? So when you compute the score code distance between traces, if your traces are, polygonal in the sense that they are piecewise linear, then the score code distance computation algorithm is quite uh, involved. Uh, and it it's almost, uh, I think, if I remember this correctly, it's cubic in the complexity, uh, the naive version of the score code distance. Mm -hmm. But if you just sample the trace and you consider the trace to be a piecewise a constant interpolation trace, so basically sample and hold semantics, then the score code distance computation is linear in the size of the trace. So it's much faster. Now there is a trade off that if your signal is kind of not varying too dramatically, then I think it makes much more sense to just downsample it and apply the piecewise constant interpolation score code algorithm. And that's going to be much faster. But if your signal does have very dramatic uh, changes and slopes that would require you to downsample at a very high frequency, then it makes sense to use the more expensive uh, algorithm. So we have some uh, work where we have studied this for some case studies. Okay. Yeah, in, in this general paper. I'll be happy to point you to it. Yeah. That would be great. Uh, my, my question is a bit more general. Is there any work on so 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 you 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 talk about downsampling and the slope of the signal and stuff, but is there any uh, theoretical result about uh, those sampling points? What are the optimal sampling points and stuff like that? Uh, In terms of score code distance, I am not familiar with anything. But I think in general, in the general area of control, there is lots of work on uh, what sampling frequency is going to make sure that you don't lose quality of your controller. Mm -hmm. uh, th there is tons of work on that, and and I think there's also work in just the context of STL on what how different interpolation schemes and different sampling schemes affect how you compute the robustness. There's there's work on that in the I think it was uh, appeared at an HSCC or an RV. I can't remember exactly, but one of these. If you could point me to that result, that would yeah. be so. We we looked at how we I have a student looking at sampling for tau epsilon in a score code, and. Uh -huh. I, 
it would be great if you, if you could have a pointer to that that uh, publication. Absolutely, I, I can right. send it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the audience? Anyone wants to ask a question before we close this meeting? Are there any further questions? No. No. OK, so thank you very much Gio, for, for this wonderful talk. Uh, thank you for being here and we will be in touch. So we will, we will definitely get back to you with more questions. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, enjoyed giving this talk and talking to you again, connecting with you. Uh, please send me email if you have any questions. I'm happy to follow. We will have many. Thank you very much. OK, great. Thank you. All right. Bye, Mohammed.